To those devoid of imagination, a blank place on the map is a useless waste. To others, the most valuable part. At the edge of civilization exists a place few have heard of and hardly any have been. A place where life is harder. <sighs> Time moves a little slower. And nights are darker. Crossing this threshold is a step back in time. History abounds and the culture rich. I'm Rob Gerstner, and as a global hunter, I travel the world in search of these blank places. And every destination has shown me that the void in the map is in reality full of amazing things. My pursuits take me to the farthest reaches of the earth in search of some of the most challenging high mountain species. And as if the rugged terrain and unpredictable weather weren't enough, I've upped the ante with a free range, fair chase, archery only standard. And this is just the beginning, driven by a passion for wildlife conservation and a fascination with history, these hunts take me on an adventure few could ever imagine. For me, hunting isn't a sport or hobby. It's a calling to something greater, an invitation to climb higher and go farther, to venture beyond the edge of civilization. Many cultures throughout history have revered mountains as sacred places. These landscapes often appear uninhabitable from a distance, but up close, they harbor some of the world's most fascinating terrestrial species. Well adapted to the rugged terrain and at times inhospitable weather, wild sheep and goats natively inhabit the mountains of North America, Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa often referred to by the Latin name Ovis, the wild sheep category includes all species and subspecies of Argali, Bighorn, Dal, Mouflon, and Uriel. Wild goats or Capra include the species and subspecies of Goat, Tur, Markor, Ibex, Chamois, and Tar. In 2010, I ventured into the mountains of the Northwest Territories where I harvested my first ever Ovis species, the doll sheep. The challenge and adventure of this hunt fed my soul in a way nothing else ever had. After harvesting both the desert and Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep in 2011, I picked up my bow with determination to complete the Grand Slam Club Ovis Triple Slam. To date, only three other hunters have ever accomplished an all archery triple slam. These world-renowned archers represent an elite club of physical and mental toughness I can only hope to join. GSCO is to wild sheep and goats what the Boone and Crockett Club is to North American Big Game, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to hunter-driven conservation efforts. The Triple Slam is a recognition reserved for those who have successfully harvested a total of 24 species of wild sheep and goats from hunts that span the globe. With the utmost care for conservation and ethical hunting practices, I set out with 100% free range, 100% fair chase, 100% archery standard. That means no high fences, no unfair advantages, and no rifles. My quest spans four continents, 11 countries, and over a decade of hunting. Six trips, 70,000 feet of climbing up and down. Anybody who takes one of these with a bow deserves a ton of respect. Being that this is the first uh, chartreuse chamois shot with a bow on record is pretty special. You can't ask for more with a bow, that's for sure. Classic free range spot and stock. The Summit by High Mountain Archery chronicles these adventures and more, sharing not just the hunt, but stories of the culture, history, and food oftentimes in places few others have ever seen. With destinations like Azerbaijan, Macedonia, Russia, and Mongolia, this is truly a unique series that breaks the mold of the average hunting show.
If there's one hunting destination on the planet that attracts more debate on ethical hunting and conservation practices, it's New Zealand, a remote island nation in the South Pacific. Known for giant red stag and world-class tar hunting, I hop on a plane for the 30-hour journey to Christchurch, where I hope to uncover some truth about the controversy surrounding big game hunting in New Zealand. Now the tar are in rut right now, or they're seeming to be in rut? Yeah, no, the tar are rutting mid-rut right now, yeah. so. And the mains this year have been exceptional. Oh, so really? We're gonna see some gorgeous, gorgeous spirits there. This is Colin Rayner. He grew up in Auckland and has spent the last 20 years as a hunting guide on the South Island with Rangitata safaris. Tomorrow, we will be hiking up the eastern range of New Zealand's famed Southern Alps in search of a mature bull tar. Do they end up in a headbutting contest a bit or are they just kind of tied up? Uh, it's a pushing fight and they know they've got horns. Quite often when we're skinning out an animal, we'll see bruising on the shoulders. So that's pretty common this time of year. In 1903, the Himalayan tar was gifted to the New Zealand government by British politician and aristocrat, the Duke of Bedford. Released near Mount Cook, the original 13 tar quickly multiplied. Fueled by the lush vegetation and lack of predators, the population had grown uncontrollably large by the 1930s, and the tar were blamed for destruction of the native habitat. Does the wildlife department have any programs to thin out the females at all? Yes, so they do. Like We're hunting on our own private land, so it's just up to us. Um, but on the public land, they uh, have set a number of how many they want on the public land, and uh, government guys just go in and just shoot everything. Since 1934, Government officials have ordered the indiscriminate slaughter of nearly 100,000 tar from public lands through the use of sharpshooters, trapping, and worst of all, a substance known as compound 1080, a poison that's so toxic and causes such an agonizing death that the FBI has identified it as a potential weapon of terrorism. The recreation hunters managed to convince the Department of Conservation to just leave the bulls alone that you control the population with the females yeah. and that you know, the males are a valuable sort of asset to have. But government attitude is don't want them and don't really care. So the, the more about the native species, which of course the only mammals that are native are, are two type of bat, and that's it. So um, we're starting to make some changes now. It's, some people a little bit higher up finally start understanding that you know, these things, people like them, people want to see them. You know? Yeah, sure. Well, there's the economy that comes along with it, too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, during World War II, they used to export the hides to um, Europe, and they would line the um, fuel tanks of all the bombers and fighters with tar skin. No kidding. The skin just closes skin up again. Skin. Yeah. I'll be darned. I had no idea there was a bit of a trade there with supporting the military with yeah. hides of tar. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Clearly, tar have a storied history in New Zealand that raises many questions about ethics and conservation. Deepening the controversy, I discover through research that some estimates put the tar population in New Zealand higher than that of their native range in the Himalaya Mountains, which is in stark decline due to habitat loss, poaching, and conflict with livestock. Could it be that one day soon, the tar of New Zealand may provide a sustainable source for replenishing the native populations in India, Nepal, and Tibet? Only time will tell, but one thing is for certain, this too will be ripe for controversy. Sleeping off the jet lag of a 9,000 mile journey, we get a late start. With a makeshift target, I double check that my bow is shooting true and nothing has rattled loose from the trip. New Zealand's Southern Alps in the background foreshadow an exciting week ahead. A short drive from the lodge and we arrive in tar country. Bingo, got one low down. Yo, 
straight over there. See the dark of those jaws that run down, the first dark one? Yep. Just follow the, that one up from the bottom, you see him in the light. You can see, him, you can see his mane shining from yeah, here. Yeah, and I see all the little. Yeah, yeah. Little ones with him. How's he fair compared to other? Like in terms of what do you figure, is he old enough? Or? Uh, yeah, mature bull. He's in a pretty good spot to yeah. make an approach. Yeah, he can come right up over top of him. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a place like this without big game. The only native mammal here is the bat, and it wasn't until European settlers arrived in the early 19th century that large game animals were introduced for both recreational and subsistence hunting. A perfect storm of unlimited food, no competition from native species, and zero natural predators resulted in a massive population explosion. In the 1960s, wild red stag were corralled into high fence game farms to cash in on the global demand for venison. It wasn't long before the ranchers discovered a demand from trophy hunters looking for an easier solution to hunting in the rugged landscape. Today, New Zealand boasts world-class hunting opportunities for red stag, elk, fallow deer, tar, chamois, and Arapawa sheep. Many of these hunts continue to be offered in high fence areas and some alpine hunts are even assisted by helicopter. Despite popular belief, there are in fact many free range fair chase hunting opportunities on both public and private land available in New Zealand. One such opportunity is here with Rangitata safaris on New Zealand's South Island. Their large, unfenced track of private land is well known for holding a healthy population of mature bull tar. How old is it, uh, I can see rings, I can't count them all. Uh, old enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. He's got a really good mane to his hair, very good and long. I can see the shape of his horns. The tips hook back in, what we call it the heart shape. His, his tips are poking out, so. It's also a sign he's a, he's a mature bull. Everyone has their own definition of heaven. This is mine. Stalking a mature mountain animal with my bow in hand in such a beautiful location. The whole experience is overwhelming for me and only gets better as we close the distance on this bull. See the two big trees out by the snow in the shadow. It just drops straight back towards us. Let's just see him there. See him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in a good spot, man. Everything's going down so far. Unfortunately, the bull has followed several nannies and crossed to the opposite mountainside. There are too many eyes and not enough cover to get any closer. Soon, this draw comes alive with even more tar watching them navigate the impossible landscape with ease and comfort is a reminder that they undoubtedly have the advantage here. Over the next several hours, the bull I'm after slowly works his way into a spot that finally gives me the opportunity I need to get within bull range. If mountain hunting is heaven, then hell is missing a shot. Luckily, this was a clean miss. It happens to every bow hunter, but that doesn't make it any easier to deal with. The shot felt right, but obviously something went wrong.
There's a ball just above the shadow line there, straight up. One's just come over the, by that clay pan as well, so just keep an eye on where they go. Right there in the middle of the field, right? Yeah, you see that one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's more than one. Yeah, yeah. And then that one on the saddle, we can't quite see it there. And there's another one here in the middle. I think what we'll do is we'll get some height anyway, because mm -hmm. we'll be in dead ground in this little draw here. We'll cut up the left. Yeah. Plus we'll get the option of cutting off the other side too. Yeah. I can't help but replay yesterday's shot in my head as we climb the same mountain after what appears to be the bull I missed. Did my rangefinder pick up brush? Did I set my sight right? Maybe I just got too excited. My doubts quickly wash away as we close the distance for a better look. I have an eerie feeling of deja vu. I'm in the same draw after the same bowl in nearly the same spot. Second chances like this don't come often, and my fingers are crossed for a different outcome than yesterday. I sit in disbelief as this second chance bull takes off unscathed. But before I can process what went wrong, Colin spots a second bull below us a little further down the ridge. Three misses in two days burns through a hunter's confidence like nothing else. I check over my bow and nothing is out of place. Ready to jump on a flight home, I notice my rangefinder is set to the wrong mode. Feelings of shame are met with relief as this is an easy fix. Good day. Managed to detect the gear problem. <laughs> now that I've looked back at those three shots, like they're all perfectly like right over, you know. Perfectly wrong. Next time on the summit by High Mountain Archery, my New Zealand adventure continues. He's in a perfect spot. You reckon he's a shooter? I reckon. 
Yeah, you reckon he's a shooter? I don't reckon I know. Okay. 